Morning, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to the Well Fed Business Podcast with I, Connor Benham, <laughs> and the evil genius. And yeah. uh, I'll be perfectly honest with you guys, I was running a little bit late this morning, or a little bit late recording, not that effect, that affects anybody that's listening to this other than John, who sat there politely waiting for me. Uh, I had a little bit of a lie in this morning, but I still had to get my morning walk in, I still had to get my morning cup in, and I still had to get my morning shit in, which has meant the first time I've looked at myself in the mirror all day is when I got on this call. And... John rightfully rightfully said to me, the first thing he said to me when I joined the call was, what the fuck is wrong with your hair? <laughs> so I just want to apologize to the viewers because, well, yes, yeah, it's, it's a hot mess right now. A couple of things. It, you know, it's a case of tell me it's morning without telling me it's the morning. Well, just yeah. look at Connor's hair. Yeah, it's really But also, weird. I'd like to pick you up on a slight point of grammar. Wouldn't it be getting your morning shit out rather than in? It's, it's interesting. <laughs> you don't know what I do on the toilet. No, I don't. <laughs> but I'm starting to get an idea. See, I leave my nighttime one in the bowl, so in the morning I can just get it back up. It leaps up. Satisfaction. Yeah, Claws its way home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just like letting the, I don't know, letting the dogs out. You know, just letting the dog well, back in. Actually, I, I don't believe you. You leave a, a, an evening shit in the bowl. You look like the kind of guy to me who would do a self enema in the shower. No. Yeah, you, you look like that kind of bloke. And you're not denying it, so... On the contrary, John. <laughs> <laughs> On the contrary, what? You are the face for shower enemas. I'm a poster boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How the fuck did we get onto shower enemas? Oh, it was me, wasn't it? it was. Anyway, as the, as the viewers and listeners can probably tell, I'm in, a, I'm in an accepted good mood this morning and for two reasons. The first is I finally got the fucking manuscript off to the proofreader yesterday. Now uh, she's going to come back, and I'm going to add some. I'm not happy with some bits of it already, but I'm going to then make some changes, send it back to her for a second reading, and also send it to Connor and Holly for a reading. But there is light at the end of the tunnel, so if you've been waiting for it, either because you've bought it or you're just interested, uh, I'm re we're recording this in the morning of the 25th of May. I reckon by the end of the first week of June, so a couple of weeks away, maybe 14, maybe 14 to 21 days two or three weeks it should be back from the printer and ready to be sent that's fucking brilliant yeah and the second here. reason i'm in a good mood and just it's probably before you share that one because we'll, we'll go on about that just want a quick note on the book yeah john's worked really fucking hard on this so if anyone's ungrateful or is upset about waiting fuck yourself it's, a, it's going to be a bloody good book. We all know how good John is at writing and when he says it, it will be there uh june it will be because it's actually been sent off uh, the manuscript. It's been sent off. He's exhausted. We've got um, the, all of the logistics set up. We found the printing house. We found the distribution network. Um, we've got everything set up on the membership site to deliver it to you as well in terms of the most unbelievable free gift ever that you're going to get with the book that we haven't actually fully announced yet, but it's going to be different uh, to the gifts that came with Wellfed Freelancer. So no complaining, just excitement. First world problems, if you're complaining. Yes. So the second reason you're excited. Yeah. Well, here's the story. As you may know, if you've listened to the previous episodes, I went up to Dublin on the 12th of April to get my blood test done to see if I was eligible for testosterone replacement therapy. Um, and as it happens, the bloods came back and I wasn't because my HCT levels were far too high at 57 point something percent. But for reasons, uh, hemo, hemo, Hemocrito thingy. Hemocrito twat waffle. Hemocrit. Hemocrit. Yeah. Hemocrit. <laughs> Hemocrit. <laughs> whatever it is. HC2. Um, I'm going to Google it because that's bugging me now. It is. Uh, uh, uh. Hematocrit. Hematocrit. So the hematocrit levels were t too high at 57%. Um, but they, for reasons I'm not going to go into, uh, have now fallen naturally to under 50%. So I'm now eligible for it. So I spoke to the doc yesterday and he said, yeah, well, go ahead. And he just went through what he's going to put on the prescription. Set. He says, all I need now is use a nominator, a pharmacy, so I can send it to tonight and they'll get it tomorrow. And because it's it's fairly new in Ireland, the, the recipient, the testosterone, 
Um, they'll probably have, we, I know it's here, um, but they might not have it in stock. So it might be over the weekend they have to get it because they get it quite quickly. And so, okay, so yeah, but just a couple of things. The first is, you, know, you might want to nominate, if you, your local pharmacy, you might want to nominate a man, a bloke, or a pharmacy you're, you're kind of friendly with. And I thought, why? It's fucking pharmacy, 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 you know? I says, well, okay, but, but why? He says, well, expect some disapproval and a shitload of qu intrusive questions. I said, okay, what is that? Mean? Well, basically, long story short, testosterone replacement therapy has got some, a certain stigma to it anyway across the board. But in certain places here in Ireland, and I live in very rural Ireland, it's it's the attitudes are often back in the 1950s 60s as they were in the uk and it's which is ironic considering we've we've had two referenda about abortion and and same-sex marriage that have been overwhelmingly fucking passed with the yes in the last few years but testosterone replacement therapy apparently in, in moral terms is right up there with you know sheep shagging and pretending to put money on the protect on the, on the collection plate in church and parking in a disabled bay without a blue badge you know it's, it's just you don't do it um and the pharmacists apparently often take it upon themselves especially women apparently take it upon themselves to put their moral stamp on 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 the delivery of, of the doctor's prescription now i know pharmacies pharmacists do an, a, a valuable job and they indeed do act as a buffer between doctors mistakes and patients welfare and if a pharmacist spots something is wrong or inappropriate, he or she should indeed say, hang on, there's something wrong here. This is not right. And they indeed can dispense medicines, you know, pharmacy only medicines. So you can avoid a doctor's visit often. But what they are absolutely not there to do is question the, the morality of someone's medical choices. So it'd be like questioning a woman's birth control. Not, I don't mean the safety of it or the method, but the fact she's doing it. You know, fuck off, it's none of your fucking business. You, know, you, don't, you don't get to make moral decisions about the medicines I have. If you think that's right, then go and get another fucking career, you know? And it's the same with this. So I'm kind of hoping, because that's kind of points out this morning, I'm looking for a fight. I'm kind of hoping my pharmacist does look down his nose at me and ask some intrusive questions, because I will turn my best salesman skills and his Socratic questioning and negotiation skills to making him realize the error of his ways he'll wish he stayed in fucking bed today if he, if he goes down that route i'm telling you because i don't care about his disapproval i'm fucking indifferent to it i mean i mean I would, if You're i was a grown man if i'm a grown man and I, I, if i was concerned man. about people's opinions about me and testosterone replacement therapy i wouldn't be talking about it on a on a podcast which is available to billions literally billions of people <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh i doubt they're judging giving out hormone altering drugs to those who want to be the opposite gender no no i i i, I bet they wouldn't do that even if they, that's that's what they genuinely thought inside they wouldn't fucking do that mm. publicly now, here's something it's else it, rem for them. it reminds me of <laughs> probably a year ago now more when i went for my covid jab up in bantry and i went into the like, the pharmacy attached to the the place with the medical center where we got the covid jab <laughs> to get some over the counter but pharmacy only painkillers because they had coding and the woman quizzed me you know have you tried this have you tried that i says look i've been managing the pain of my acute tendonitis for several years sometimes codeine and paris codeine and ibuprofen are the only things that touch it the doctor previously put me on um uh i can't remember what it's called now so a much stronger painkiller um but that's prescription only but this is fine and you know what she said well Next time you want to buy this, and I've got my, this is the face, you know, this is what autism looks like, badge on. Just, next time you want to buy this, I think you should bring a letter in from your doctor. Patronising fucking cow. And I thought to myself, if I, if I wasn't autistic, if you didn't know I was autistic, you would not be saying that to me now. You know, that is mansplaining effectively. And I said, well, I've got my wife here if you need her permission, you know. Perhaps you'll get a letter from her parents, but they're both dead. So are you going to sell it to me or not? I'm not I'm not here to ask your opinion or your advice. I just want you to sell me the fucking painkiller. I didn't swear. I'm just here, you know, I just want you to sell me the painkiller, which she did in the end. But I thought, you patronising fucking bitch. Honestly, it made me laugh. But here's the thing. Here, that kind of bigotry when directed at a, a, a white male, middle-aged white male, doesn't matter. 
you know, we can ignore it. It's probably my fault in some way for not getting a letter from my doctor. But if, if we did the same thing because she was a woman, you know, it'd be mansplaining. There'd be fucking posts on LinkedIn about it and no doubt fucking giant pink fallacies outside Liverpool Street Station, if you saw that. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's a protest. Don't be a dick. Anyway. Anyway. That's my, how my morning started. <laughs> not, with a, not with a giant pink dick. <laughs> <laughs> and mine started it, it might do in future way. when i'm on the testosterone it might have a few giant pink dicks then but not well, yet you hope so i you? fucking hope so i want my money back otherwise little floppy john's been hanging about the last couple floppy of days john. <laughs> <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's not so much floppy john as completely uninterested in sex john which is absolutely novel for me should we talk about the topic at hand let's talk about the topic at hand <laughs> just the 14 minutes later yeah <laughs> um so we had something planned, but then John obviously read my remarkable email that I sent out on Wednesday, I do believe, all about AI. So John, that, that, that manifested into John's subconscious mind, and he's now proposed it as his idea to talk about today. So John, why don't we talk about your topic, um, <laughs> why you... AI is going to kill your business? Do you really think I read your emails? Fucking hell. Whoa, that's way up there in cloud cuckoo land, that is. I reckon you do. You reckon I do? I reckon you do. You know denial, don't you? It's not a river running through Egypt. You're the one denying that you, re you, you, that you read them. I'm not denying anything. I'm making an assumption. An assumption? An assumption. An assumption? An assumption. <laughs> this could go on for a long time, couldn't it? Yeah, we're a pair of stubborn fuckers. We're more than happy to do that for half an hour and then say, right, that's the podcast done. Right, Hollywood so... Hollywood yeah. loses our shit at us. We can tell she's away. Like. I know, because everything works properly. <laughs> yeah, so uh, there's, there's three reasons. I mean, AI is going to kill your business if you're not careful. Although not for the reasons you think it is. Um... Because, and I say that because a lot of people, especially freelancers, are panicking over AI and what it can and can't do. And, and, and to the point, it's it's now, there are now politicians and, and quangos and other committees being formed to, to kind of regulate all this stuff. And it's fucking dangerous because regulation in panic is not a good way to make laws. It just isn't. You know, you're legislating for, for, em, for emotional reasons is not good. All right. So... AI is going to be damaging for your business because you're you're worrying about and panicking. Well, you shouldn't panic anyway. It's not it's not beneficial, but you're worrying about and focusing on the wrong things. Okay, people seem to be of the opinion if I don't grasp AI now, if I don't get in on the ground floor, it's going to be too late and I'm going to be on the outside. It's the FOMO thing, fear of missing out. It's nothing more than that. It, it was the same with do you remember Clubhouse. Oh God, yeah. Yeah, Clubhouse. It was the same for all new things. And if you if you doubt me on this, I just just do this little test. Go onto LinkedIn, and then think back. Well, first think back about six months and think how many people in their tagline, their headline, whatever you like to call it, had themselves described as AI experts. I, I bet you didn't see one ever. It just wasn't there, unless you were actually an AI technological technology person like a programmer or something an expert or you studied these things it, it just wasn't there now you go onto linkedin and there's all these people with ai expert this prompt expert ai that they're a, they're coming out of the fucking woodwork they're, they're like the life coaches of the of the mid 90s or the sorry the late 90s and the early thousands like the early 2000s you know it's saying that everyone then was a life coach because that was a newfangled thing. And then not many years later, everyone was a fucking website designer. Okay. Uh, well, it's now everyone's an AI expert and it's embarrassing. I mean, don't get me wrong. If you, if you do know how to write AI prompts, they can be incredibly useful. That is a skill in and of itself. And some of these, these crib sheets on how to write AI prompts are quite useful. But AI is not going to take your business over, and if you don't get in, if you don't get involved or OK with AI, and become an expert on AI, you will honestly, I promise you, you're not going to lose your business because of it. 
you know, I'd be very, very surprised if anybody did. The reason being, um, there was a fundamental misunderstanding of um, what AI is. I mean, chat GPT, this is going to change in the near future, I believe. But chat GPT's database is what, three years old, two years old, mm-hmm. something like that. They've just released Chat GPT five in the US, which uh, is is a little less old. I think it's like a, a year old or something. Right. So you know, it, it, it's and all it's doing is it, it's it's a curator basically. It, it's not got real intelligence. So you know, it, I, I, I get sick and tired of saying this to people. You know, if if you're if you are that bad at your job. You can be replaced by a tool. That's all it is—a tool which can suck in an enormous amount of data, summarize it, and spit it out in a in a natural language way. In natural language, if if you can if you can be replaced by that, then you're not very good at your job, and you should be worried. Yes, and the answer then is to upskill yourself. So that's what people should be worried about. They should be asking the question: Okay, can I be replaced by a tool? Can my work be replaced by a tool? which can draw on the, 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 the massed sum of knowledge of humanity online two years ago, okay, and, and able to summarize that. Can I be replaced by a tool that does that in my work? If you can, then yeah, you, you should be worried. If you can't, please don't worry. So if you're a bricklayer, I promise you, AI is not gonna destroy your business. No. It's not gonna destroy our business too, because the stuff we talk about, we talk about behind closed doors, chat GPT, even real time, chat gpt for instance like the google bard replacement uh, or the competitor which has real-time access to the internet even that won't be able to come out with the insights we come out with because the stuff we talk about and produce is one is kept behind closed doors and two it relies on human intuition and the kind of cognitive leaps that ai at the moment certainly cannot make most people can't fucking make it let alone ai that's what you should be focused on Upskilling yourself, becoming an expert in a very narrow field of expertise. If you're someone who works in a field where, and you now feel like AI is starting to tread on your toes, um, perhaps with video editing or photo editing or podcast editing, they're, they're the areas I see that are shit scared about this a lot. There's never been a better time to, as John just said, you know, up level yourself and start thinking, right, how can I build out a consulting arm of this? Because if it's going to make the thing more accessible, more people are going to be doing it. But AI is never going to be able to give it to them perfectly, exactly how they want it. So then you'll come in at the very end as an expert, because they won't be looking for a lackey to do this, to come at the end and consult on whatever project they're working on. They'll be looking for an expert to come in and consult with them on whatever the AI tool uh, the AI tool they've used has done. Um, <clears throat> I feel really strongly about that. If if your tools, if if your actual like craft is going to be more readily available, you should be looking to build out a consulting arm. And don't just give up your craft as a whole, because there will still be people that want to pay for the very best. And I highly doubt that AI is going to be able to give them exactly what they want, bespoke, custom, to a T, without a lot of frustration, because that means they'd have to sit there playing around with this interface. No, they'd much rather just bark instructions to you, the human, who's actually going to do it. And you'll be able to command a premium because it's handmade and we all know that mm. the, the the premium that gets supplied to things handmade you call a fucking tomato ketchup homemade or handmade or fucking artisan a bottle of heinz is three quid i fucking saw a bottle of ketchup the other day artisan homemade ketchup for a tenner i was like yeah you fucking lost the plot yeah and we we, in it. we we buy a very expensive brown sauce from the supermarket it's imported from the uk and it's handmade it's you know it's it's homemade. It's artisanal. Mm. Who put the anal in artisanal? Mm. It's artisanal <laughs> brown sauce, which is a fraction of HP or daddy's. No, sorry, it's, it, HP or daddy's is a fraction of the cost of this, this anus stuff, you know? <laughs> anus it's brown artis- sauce. Anus juice. That's what it is. This is anus juice. Yeah. Anal brown. And the second thing, of course, moving on from that is... Um, it, it's mass hysteria. 
if you're spending all your time on LinkedIn, which most people, a lot of people are, I, I, I was alerted to a post of the day of, and it's actually someone who embarrassingly enough is an ex client of mine. He was basically saying, you, you, you know, the days of just posting once or twice a day on LinkedIn are gone. And now you need to be on there for two or three hours every day. Fuck. <laughs> Half your working day on LinkedIn playing at silly buggers. Um, but anyway, he, uh, um, if you're, if you are immersed in, in any forum or any, any medium, any platform, any community for hours of your day and you're discussing these things or even just reading them and absorbing them, even if you make no personal comment, you are going to start thinking like everybody else. You're like, a, like lemmings, you know, which isn't true, by the way. Lemmings don't throw themselves off a cliff. Um, you are going to start thinking. It's like, you know, we, we know that if you surround yourself with a group of people, you take on their, start to take on their traits and attributes. You start to act like they do. Well, th this is also true with remote connections. So if you're thinking, speaking, writing, reading, listening to the same message over and over again, you're going to take it on. Have you seen the film with Al Pacino called Cruising? No. I Where is, is, it's quite an old film. He's an a undercover policeman in the gay community in, uh, somewhere in California, San Francisco. And he's basically, um, he's, they're looking for a, a guy who's murdering, serial killer of homosexuals. So he, he goes, he, he goes undercover in the gay community and it starts to affect him. He's not gay, but he starts to start thinking like he's gay and starts to act in a, it's really fucking powerful film, but that's true. That this is what, you know, if you, it's like male hairdressers who work with women, they become quite, not saying they become gay or anything, but they become quite effeminate in their mannerisms and their speech and their, their body language. They just do because that's whom they work with. Well, if you're thinking. <laughs> If you're doing this on LinkedIn and everything's everyone's going on about how dangerous AI is and how bad it is, you're going to start to believe that and, and act like it yourself. It's groupthink. It's fucking dangerous. Yeah, it is really, really silly, especially because it's so early in its infancy. No, no one can predict where this is really going to go. Um, in fact, a lot of the AI tools that I've seen that are apparently coming for people's jobs, they're just being used to help those people whose jobs they're apparently coming after. Um, so for example, uh, in Photoshop, uh, Adobe Photoshop, they recently released AI generative fill. So for example, say you had a aspect ratio, just 10 by 10 standard square photo, and you wanted it on a 16 by nine aspect ratio, which is say the size of a YouTube thumbnail. You could go into Adobe, put the uh, reference photo in, click their little AI tool and click generative fill. Now, the only people that are bloody doing that are the fucking photo editors in the first place. No one, no one who was previously engaging photo editors to do this for them is now downloading Adobe and trying to do it themselves. Because guess what? The finished product after that is pretty good, but it's not fantastic. You know, it's pretty good. People have opinions and people will always have opinions and they'll want things custom to them. As long as people want things custom to them, you're going to be just bloody fine. There's also um, a little tool for podcasts uh, called Autopod. For anyone who runs a podcast, it can be quite time intensive, cutting the cameras, um, syncing up the microphones, muting a microphone when the other person's talking. It can be quite time intensive. Uh, there's now this apparently AI plugin uh, that does all of that for you. And people are losing their mind. But that, I, I'm pretty sure that isn't AI because way before this thing called, called Autopod released, we've been using tools to do just that. And it's just based on the waveform, who's speaking at what point, and then it just syncs it up with the cameras. Like, really simple stuff. So there's a lot of stuff out there that is apparently AI. It absolutely isn't. And it's there to assist you not come for you so you really got to chill out when people are saying to you you know it's coming for your job copywriters beware you should only be worried if you're shit whatever field you're in you should only be worried if you're shit and regardless of ai if you're shit you should be worried because that means there are people far better than you and you will struggle to make a living it's that I, and you should too it's just it's just the common what is it it's just a com common enemy 
and that unites mm. people and gives people an excuse. It lifts the, the blame well, off their shoulders. The, the classic story from history here is when the uh, the automated loom was invented, the weaving loom. The Guild of Weavers protested, and you know they would go on witch hunts and smash up the looms and probably burn people at the stake for having these looms because they were coming for the, the looms were coming for their jobs. It's natural progress, you know. AI will progress to a point, and I hope to see it in my lifetime, when we will have perhaps a human equivalent AI. It will be, it, for all intents and purposes, it will be alive and sentient. I hope so, and I hope we treat it decently. I'm yeah, not, I'm amazing. not, I'm not betting on it from the way we kind of treat each other, let alone fucking animals. Oh, um, but I hope to see that in my lifetime, and you know, maybe there will come become a time when most intellectual jobs will be taken over but there will still be because there will always be people who are willing to pay for the human element that's never going to change you know we make cars in robot factories but we still get handmade cars and they come out they come under premium that will always be true you can't change that march of progress but you can choose where you position yourself within it um i think it's fantastic you know, I think it the is, whole, I think it's, it's brilliant. Exciting. And it, it, it is exciting. It's, it's truly an opportunity for those that are currently lackeys. They're just an extra pair of hands to do a job for someone that doesn't want to do the job themselves. You, you should see this as an opportunity because you'll be able to take advantage of these tools that the layman isn't aware about. You'll be able to automate a lot of your workflow, make it a lot quicker. And with that time you're saving, you can fucking study and become a top 1% person in your field because I promise you, when 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 the bottom of the barrel is raised, so when the floor of standards is significantly raised, which is what AI will do, the demand to work with the people at the very top 1% increases tenfold because it's all squished together that little bit more, which means that the outliers at the top, they stand out even further because it's, 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 it's such a smaller spectrum of quality. Um, I found a little graph that explains it far better than I do there. But take this opportunity to uh, to build a consulting arm. That'd be my biggest advice. Mm. And if you are going to study, here's my advice. Okay, you You won't learn much of any value by sitting on social media, again, I'm going to use LinkedIn as an example because that's where it happens most. You won't learn a lot. Say you're say you're a copywriter and you think, shit, this is this is quite worrying. I need to be better. I need to be an A-lister. You won't become an A-lister by being on LinkedIn talking about copywriting with other copywriters and reading their five tips to to write a better paragraph or a headline. Okay, because most of the copywriters talking about that kind of stuff on LinkedIn aren't very good. Okay. The, the top copywriters, they do post on LinkedIn, but they post sparingly and they post to generate leads. They don't so talk busy. much about copywriting to teach other, each other. And the reason is they're too fucking busy serving clients. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're, they're too busy to waste their time talking about the trivia, the ephemeral shit that's irrelevant to most copywriters. All right. Mm -hmm. they're, just not, they're, just, they're just not doing it. So use that time to study 10,000 hours, well, 8, 000, was it 800 hours to become conversant in a topic or so, and about 10,000 hours to become uh, a real like expert. That. However, yes. I would hazard a guess that the standards for that have dropped way lower. <laughs> like, uh, I'm pretty sure I said to you at the moment, I feel like if you read two books on a topic, oh yeah, yeah. you can well, go on the news and you can, <laughs> you, you'll be seen to, but, to be an expert. And the quality of questioning, critical thinking, you'll be able to fly by as an expert. I, I saw... And I swear I'm not making this. I saw a woman on LinkedIn the other day claiming, and this was a post on how to do it as well. This was a how-to post on how to master direct response copywriting. She was very specific, how to master direct response copywriting in three months. <laughs> I know. Three months. I know. It was fucking laughable. Well, if that's the quality of thinking on LinkedIn about expertise and expert status i fucking worry for humanity man to become a master at something <laughs> the, the, you... <laughs> i don't think i'm a master copywriter i've been doing it no, for 20 I, I, years I, I don't think you can be but also to, to to even become close to that title 
to, to be a true master in something, I feel like you have to be a, an expert in several other fields as well. Pretty much a polymath. Draw from, yeah, from disparate sources. Mm. And you can come up with your own ideas, your own conclusions. Like if you just study very narrowly one field, you'll become really fucking good. But you'll also have the blinkers on. You, you become a bit of an idiot, to be perfectly honest. You become a really smart idiot who knows just one thing. Um, it reminds me of when I was younger, actually, in your elite group. And... uh a lot of idiots in there. Yeah, I was doing Facebook ads, and you said to me, "Look, Connor, if you want to be seen as the top top geezer, you can't just be Facebook ads. You have to be a marketer. It has to be marketing and Facebook ads." So th the reason I did so well when I was younger with Facebook ads isn't because I was a Facebook ads guy. It was because I'd studied the hell out of direct response marketing, knew all about that knew all about all of the offline stuff, all of the principles. I took the principles and applied it to Facebook. And the reason clients love me is because I was able to then weave the online with the offline. It wasn't just I was a little fucking, I'm a little monkey, you can get your clicks to your website. It was, no, I can sit there and I can consult about the whole thing and weave direct response marketing through it. It's like you and your copywriting. You've got such a diverse range of writing. Uh, everything from sci-fi sci 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 to smut to direct response to hardcore sales. And that's what makes you such a good copywriter because you, you've done it in a range of fields. Then you've got the sales skills. Mm. Then you've got the marketing skills. And it's all of these different things that you've studied that allows you to become a true master in that that one place. So again, if, if you are going to follow our advice and knuckle down on that consulting idea, don't just study the thing. You need to have a multi multiple areas well, yeah. that you can Be draw from and become, have your own conclusions. Become well-read. Yeah, um, what you've just described there is a thing called synthesis, where you take diverse skills or information and you bring them together to form something new. Right? Mm. Now, I'm, I, I, I would be very clear about this. I have an advantage over probably nine, more than 99% of humanity here because I have an Asperger's brain. Our brains are very much more highly connected inside between neurons. The upside of that is we are great synthesists. We see patterns where you won't. And that's another thing that AI is not particularly good at necessarily, though it is in some esoteric cases. We very see patterns where field. others won't. Hey? Very good at uh, establishing patterns in the medical world. Yes, yeah, so exactly. That's that's one of the, one of the things I mean. But we we can draw from many disparate um, sources, and we put together a, a a synthesized conclusion, if you like. A conclusion is too small a word, but I can't think of a better one at the moment. Whereas most neurotypicals can't do that. The downside of it is it also means we're very susceptible to sensory overload because of those interconnections. So loud sounds are even louder, bright lights are even bright, brighter. Uh, busyness is even busier. But anyway, that's the, by the by. For those you need to are... learn to synthesize. <clears throat> and the way you do that is by everything you read, establish the principles. Mm. The principles, the strategy. If you, if you live life on a principles first basis, life becomes a lot easier. Definitely. Your principles are also things like your, your values, your rules, your boundaries. If everything you study, you try to find the constraints, you find the pillars that are supporting that industry up. You know, what, what are the things that are fundamental truths? If you find those pillars, it makes synthesizing a hell, a hell of a lot easier because you know the rules and the constraints to play within. Yeah, without question. Now, the last thing I want to say is, and, and this is, Again, we can learn this from history. Look at Clubhouse, look at TikTok, look at Instagram, look at anything you care to mention pretty much. The people who make the most out of AI at the moment, I'm not talking about the, the people, the technological innovators who own the systems. I don't mean those right now. Um, that's, I'm talking about lay people, I, I suppose, people who use the technology. The people who will make the most out of AI are going to be the people who are selling you how to use AI secrets. Mm -hmm. It's the same with everything. I mean, I, I said this often because it's true. You know, it's much easier to sell the how to than to do the how to. This is why we've got everyone is fucking on as a coach. This is why we had so many people become life coaches because it's much easier. <laughs> I've got a fucking spider coming down my screen. Now you can't see it on there. I love spiders. Um, 
I've, I've got <laughs> it's really distracting um you know this is why when say growing a business or, or sorting your life out for life coaches or or being great on LinkedIn, it's much easier to sell the idea of, hey, I can show you how to make money doing this thing than it is to do the thing yourself and make money from it. And if you doubt me, just think of all the people, and I bet everyone has seen this. If you're on LinkedIn, I bet you've seen this. People who've got LinkedIn trainer, letting, getting you quality leads from your LinkedIn posts, et cetera, et cetera, your LinkedIn content. That's what they do. And I bet you've seen the people who do that posting saying i'm struggling to get leads why aren't you using your own fucking system and if you are it's clearly not working why are people selling stuff say on instagram and tiktok how to get billions of followers without paid advertising selling it with paid advertising how does that work how is that not how are, not, how are people not seeing that going what the fuck is going on here yeah it is easier to sell the how-to than it is to do the how-to now we sell the how-to I'm not not going to deny that, but you know what? We do the how to, and we've done the how to, and I've done the how to for myself and others as well. You know? And also, we, we we sit and consult with you to make sure you're implementing it correctly. It's not just preaching from the uh, what's it called? What's that wooden pulpit? The pulpit. We're not preaching from the pulpit and then telling you to fuck off and figure it out. Well, we are if you're not paying us. But for those that pay, <laughs> yeah, obviously. For those that pass, we invite you into the priest chambers after and encourage you to bring your children. Buggy, there's yeah. a, there's a, there's a, how do I say this without saying it, John? I don't know. Cause I don't know what you're saying. There's a guy who is an old school internet marketer. Uh, initial, his first name begins with a P. He's written, that's a clue. He, He's written lots of books on things like the ultimate guide to Facebook, the ultimate guide to TikTok, the ultimate guide to everything. It's just every, everything's immediately a book. He's got one on Clubhouse too, funnily enough. Um, is it? Is it? Is this helping you ring any bells? No. They've got a glasses and a goatee. Very popular back in the day uh, about Facebook ads in particular. I think I might know who it, it was. He very big at Google AdWords at one point. Yeah, I think I know who you mean. He's religious. Yeah, very. I think. Yes, I know who you mean. Okay. Um, anyway, he it finished not long ago because if I give the days away, everyone would definitely be able to piece it together. They just ran an event uh, called. Well, it was all about the future of uh, generating traffic and lead generation. Uh, using ai and how you have to use ai now with your all of your online ads and if you're not using ai with all of your ads you're a fucking dumb dumb and you're going to get left behind yeah it's that it's the i was right it is him yeah and um a good friend of us uh, a client privately of both of us in the past has attended said sem seminar oh yeah he's very big on this guy yeah, 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 yeah. And I just, it just makes me a bit icky. <laughs> a bit icky. Icky. It's like, it's interesting. I, if it was on the radio whilst I was driving home from football, I'd listen. But I think it's way too early to be charging a lot of money to say you're an expert authority on something that is changing by the minute. It's something you don't understand anyway. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I, I despair of the human race at times. Something, and I'm not blowing my own horn here for no reason, something I've had said to me often over the years, and it's, it's even in some of the testimonials, I believe, so I'm not clearly not making this up. And I'm talking about clients who've been with me for 15 years or more. They say, one of the things we'd really like about you, John, is your message doesn't change. I'm talking the same way about email marketing, pricing, positioning, sales. The same now pretty much as I've always done. The, the details sometimes change as I learn more. The nuances change. And sometimes technology allows things to develop. They're just tactical. But the principles I talk about, assertiveness, positioning, negotiation, 
none of that changes. And, and, it, and that's the thing about fundamentals. Fundamentals do not change. There's a really the, good I mean, book. Sorry, go on. No, I, I, I was really... just going <laughs> to... You was just going to what? I was just going to say, by analogy, human beings are the same now as they were, say, 50,000 years ago. The, 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 the objective development, the evolution of our bodies and brains is negligible. You could you could take someone, you could pluck someone in a time machine back from 10,000 years ago, put them in a modern day kindergarten baby, and they'd grow up to be an adult and be they'd be indistinguishable other than at the genetic level slightly from a, another, any other human being on the planet. All right. So we haven't changed, but people keep saying, oh, yeah, we've changed that. This is a new paradigm. No, no, the, the, the changes are superficial and, 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 and surface. Fundamentally, the same. it's the same with these principles I'm talking about. The fundamental principles of business and marketing, et cetera, et cetera, haven't changed. They never will. Well, not while we kill human anyway. They don't change. And I've been preaching that and preaching that and preaching it. And that's why our stuff works and why it still works. And it will continue to work. Anyway, Karen, what were you going to say? I know this episode was about AI, but I do think the big takeaway from everyone is the importance of thinking in, you know, first order principles. Yes, I agree. From Critical thinking. Resources. Yeah, but 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 establish the principles ac across you know loosely related fields to the one that you want to be an expert in if you understand all of the principles and then you can think critically on top of that and come up with you know logical good conclusions that's irresistible that's thought leadership um mm. side note saw someone on linkedin the other day they've got a full-time job their 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 tagline was uh, thought leadership for entrepreneurs Can you be a thought leadership for entrepreneurs with a full-time job? Not really. Yeah. Not, unless that is your job somewhere, I suppose. No, no, no. The job was uh, public service. No, you can't really. The book recommendation I was going to make is uh, it's a book called Principles by Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio, is uh, he runs Black's, Black Rock or Blackstone uh, Management Consulting. It's, it's an investment firm. His story is amazing. He's now ex extremely, incredibly rich. And the only books he's ever written are all about principles. There's prin he, there's four of them. Uh, the one I recommend is Principles for Life and Work, to be exact. Uh, but there's three other ones, I do believe, about other areas of life. Uh, he's recently brought something out. Uh, it's a little journal, actually. Uh, it comes with some videos and a book, I do believe. And it's all about developing your own principles for life and business. Uh, and it's a three month or so program. Now I can't speak to that because I haven't done it. However, it looks very interesting, but read principles, life and work by Ray Dalio, incredible book. Here's the thing. Principles are, um, they're like building blocks. Yeah. That's exactly what he says in the book. He's, ah, he was a shit. I'm a genius. And he, he built a multi, he manages billions of pounds now in his investment firm billions of other people's money and uh, he says the only reason he ever got there is because all he ever did was look for the principles and then followed uh, the rules yeah. that the, the principles portrayed and, and on the other hand tactics are like say decorations movable furniture paint mm. they are useless now, they sit within the house on the foundations cling to the walls but without those principles you know if you try and put say a roof on weak walls, the walls will collapse. If you try and put, if you put the roof on the floor, you don't have rooms at all. So tactics are built on the, the correct principles. Principles mm -hmm. support the correct tactic. Too many people, too many people don't know the difference between the two, don't understand why the difference between the two is so critical. And probably worst of all, can't distinguish between the two. And we've got that with AI. Mm. AI is a tactical thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you stick to the principles, you may or may not need AI or be able to use AI. I sometimes do it. I will sometimes write, say, a two or three paragraphs. And if I've been writing for a long time, I'm tired. I'll put them into chat GPT and I'll say, um, do these paragraphs make sense or should they be one paragraph or two? Something like that. It's quite a detailed prompt. And it will tell me. And probably 80% of the time I'm right in what I've done. Sometimes it, it it will suggest some some changes which I often ignore because it can't see the full context of what I'm doing. Mm. But it's a it's a sanity check. That's a tactical use of something. It's a tool. 
Okay, yeah. I do not write the book by saying, <laughs> "Here's what I want to say. Tell me how to say it." And we're still sending it off to someone, aren't we? A human being yeah, who's got forty years experience say. as a proofreader and copy editor. Most so yeah, there, there's a tab with which GT. that's a pretty good, pretty good place to mark to wind this up. I think. Yeah. Completely agree. So you can um, do the outro this time because I'm knackered. I need a piss as well. Yeah, I'm really tired today. I was about five yesterday to get this manuscript done, and now I just want to go back to bed. You, Don't make me work out. John has done the manuscript, so John deserves to go to bed. So on that note, thank you for listening all the way to the end. If you want to work with us privately, email holly, H-O-L-L-Y, at wellfedbusiness.com. If you can't spell that, we don't want to work with you. Um, cheers for listening. See you later. And... Uh, yeah. Ta-da for now. Bye-bye. Bye.